Hi, Robert. Thanks a lot for the time you're taking to give us some insights into the NGO trial that is still ongoing in Cairo, Egypt. The next trial session will be on January 10th, that is upcoming. Apart from all the details to this trial that we will be discussing later, what are your expectations for this day coming up? Well, uh, we've kind of given up on uh, trying to predict the future. Uh, this will be the court's third attempt to hear the closing arguments of the defense lawyers. Um, we were in court in November for closing arguments. They were delayed, and we were back in December, and uh, that hearing lasted all of about 17 minutes because the judges decided that they were on strike due to the, uh, the current ongoing constitutional crisis. So we anticipate closing arguments, um, and then we're told from there there will probably be a break, and the next step would be verdict. So you do not expect the verdict, though, on January 10th, do you? Uh, it's difficult to predict. Um, there will probably be, I mean, there's five different legal teams, so depending on how long uh, lawyers decide to talk, um, it could be a very long day in court, and uh, traditionally, I'm told anyway, that, that there, there would then be a break for 30 days before a verdict, but I'm also told it's possible, so we'll, so, uh, we'll show up at 10 a.m. on Thursday and see what happens. Everything's open then again. Can you give us some insight? When this started in December 2011, was there any sign before that for you that something like this could happen? No, not really. Um, I mean, there was some talk uh, in the Egyptian state-controlled media, um, but uh, at the time of the raid, uh, NDI, the organization that I used to work for, um, we were uh, licensed uh, uh, election observers, so we were heavily engaged with the High Election Commission uh, and we'd been in regular contact with the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, so uh, the raid was a complete surprise to us. We were four or five days out from round three of the parliamentary elections. We had international observers from all over the world that were flying in that afternoon. Uh, so it was, uh, it was a surprise to us. Um, you know, we uh, spent the day, um, you know, in the office with, the, with this armed raid uh, that uh, took place in 17 different uh, non-governmental organizations around the country, and, uh, you know, the, there was no warrant, there was no explanation. Uh, they seized files, computers, uh, pretty much stripped the building. Uh, we still, ironically, five days later, still maintained our observation mission. Uh, we had a team of about 40 observers and uh, carried on our work regardless. But uh, so, yeah, no, we had uh, no real idea that it was coming. And did you get any information when the raid was going on, what they wanted and what you were charged with? No. Uh, there was no warrant presented, no explanation presented. Um, outgoing phone calls were uh, prohibited. So, uh, yeah, there was no, we had no real idea as to what was happening. And am I correct that you had to hand over even your cash? Uh, yes, they, they seized cash from several offices. Um uh, I know that in our office in particular, I forget what the exact amount was, but we, uh, you know, with an international observation mission, uh, our organization would pay, uh, you know, for the travel and lodging of all of our observers. And we're talking, you know, the kind of caliber of people, former ministers, uh, former members of parliament, current members of parliament from around the world. Uh, so when they come in to do an observation mission in a foreign country, uh, you know, the, our organization would provide them with travel and lodging and, and also give them uh, some per diem just to pay for their food while they were uh, guests uh, uh, in Egypt as uh, election observers. So that's what they seized was the money that was supposed to go to uh, our uh, election monitors. And that was, of course, until today, never returned? Uh, nothing has been returned. Okay. Uh, uh, they, they even seized the personal laptops of several of our Egyptian uh, staff members and uh, they have not been returned. When did you learn personally what the charges were? I learned in early February uh, on Twitter. Uh, there was a news conference by the prosecutors. Um, uh, I believe the exact date was February 6th. And uh, there was a journalist uh, from Al Jazeera, if I recall correctly, who was tweeting the names as they were read. So that's how I found out. I was actually in a meeting and, and discovered that I'd been charged with two felonies. You had to learn that from Twitter. <laughs> yes, that's how I was informed. Have you learned whether this is the usual way it is done? I am told it is not. I, you know, uh, I'm told that uh, there were quite a few uh, uh, sort of uh, judicial uh, missteps along the way. Um, 
I mean, I was uh, interrogated in mid-January uh, by state security, and uh, there was a travel ban that was put on us. So, we, I mean, we knew something was coming, but we didn't know, you know, there was no knock on the door with a piece of paper or anything like that. It was, uh, it was done via news conference. And during this interrogation with uh, state security, there was no hint as to what charges could be laid. Uh, no, I was interrogated for approximately one hour. Uh, the first 30 minutes of the interrogation were all about uh, uh, Egyptian and U.S. governmental relations, of which um, I had no working knowledge of. Uh, my role here was, uh, was as a political party trainer or teacher. Uh, I had nothing to do with the interactions with USAID or the U.S. Congress. At one point, I was asked a question if I felt that our actions violated the 1979 Camp David Accords, to which I honestly responded, I have not read the Camp David Accords. It's not my job. Uh, so, And then the, the second part of the interview was focused on what my job was. At the time, I was uh, an international election observer. Uh, that was of no interest to them. Uh, they said there was nothing wrong with that. Uh, they wanted to know what I'd been doing the prior six months, so I was very honest with them. I told them that we taught political activists and, and political parties, uh, you know, the fundamentals of how to run a, a campaign. Um, and, uh, you know, so the, the questioning was, was long, but uh, it, it didn't it didn't ever strike into any grounds that I thought I was violating any laws uh, in Egypt. So, You had only arrived in Egypt about six months prior to this, is that correct? Arrived in June of 2011. Early June. So, uh, you know, at the time, you'd had uh, everything was on fast track uh, politically here. You had the 18 days of the revolution, then you had the March referendum, and then you had an explosion of political parties. Um, uh, you know, anyone that knows Egyptian history prior to the fall of Mubarak, there were some opposition parties, but, you know, they weren't really allowed to freely operate uh, in the political space. So, With the fall of Mubarak, you had a new political party law. So at one point over the summer, we were seeing in excess of 120, 130 political parties that were in the process of form, forming themselves. And so you had uh, you know, a real explosion of people that were forming political parties that were planning to run candidates for parliament, and they had never done this. So the thrust of my work Uh, having managed political campaigns for 23 years all over the globe, was to simply come in and teach, you know, how do you run a grassroots campaign? How do you give a proper interview? How do you, you know, uh, build a political party? And so when I landed in June, that is what we did every day, uh, right up until the election started, and then we all flipped over to become uh, international election observers. With the 23 years background you have all around the world, um, I believe you even worked in Zimbabwe, etc. Have you ever experienced anything like this before? Uh, in terms of, of being charged uh, with felonies, no, uh, I have not. I have, uh, you know, I've worked. Uh, I've worked in a couple of Islamic-based uh, countries with, uh, uh, you know, sort of multi-party multi -party democracies. Had no trouble whatsoever. Um, you know, this was a surprise. This was, you know, uh, sort of a real setback uh, in the progress of Egypt coming out of the Mubarak regime. Um, you know, the, the organization I worked for, we really sort of focused on four areas of society, one being the development of political parties. And, you know, we didn't pick sides. If you were a qualified political party, we, and, you know, we would work with you. Um, We also had uh, a division that dealt with civil society that worked with citizen groups um, uh, from around the country. You know, how to best uh, organize yourselves, how to run citizen-based campaigns to, you know, uh, affect change at the local level. And then we had two on the election sphere. We had one where we did voter education around the country uh, because the one thing I had never seen before in my travels was an election system as complicated as what Egypt had. Uh, but, you know, we did hundreds of events around the country just teaching people how the voting process would work. Uh, and then the fourth area we did was the election observation, which, again, was an Egyptian government-sanctioned uh, exercise. I have a nice little Egyptian government badge with my photograph and a barcode, which during the elections gave me access to every polling location in the country. Well, at least you're well known, thank God. <laughs> When all this happened, it, uh, it of course caused a stir worldwide and um, a huge diplomatic row between America and Egypt. 
uh, which led in the end to a bailout, let's call it that way, with millions of dollars paid. And on March 1, on March 1st, uh, a U.S. military plane took off from Cairo, not only with the Americans, there was also an implication of the Konrad Adenauer Stift in Germany. Um, the CEO was also on that plane. You were not on that plane. Why not? I was not on that plane. I, um, I, you know, I made a decision from the beginning uh, after after working here for six or seven months. Uh, of the forty three individuals that were charged, uh, four of them uh, were Egyptians from our staff, and they didn't have a U.S. military plane to get onto. They didn't have an embassy to run to, and so I made a decision very on that. Uh, you know, these these four Egyptians who, who you know, two of them worked directly for me. Uh, that I was going to stay and fight this beside them. Um, I I just was never personally comfortable with fleeing and uh, you know and leaving them to fend for, the, for themselves, uh, staring at a potential four to six year prison term. So it was a controversial decision amongst uh, you know the powers that be in the U.S. government and the Egyptian government, but it's a decision that I made uh, just pretty much out of you know personal conviction. And, and loyalty to to those that have been loyal to me, working on my staff all year. How did your employer, the National Democratic Institute, react to this? Uh, they fired me. <laughs> how did you uh, How did you react to that? <laughs> Take uh, two well, to a tango. You know, <laughs> I, you know, on the one hand, I did I did defy a direct order. I mean, there was uh, there was a lot of pressure on me uh, first to seek sanctuary in the U.S. Embassy. Uh, at the time, we were travel banned. Uh, I, I didn't have an interest in that because I wasn't interested in pretrial detention for an unknown amount of time uh, in the U.S. Embassy. And then the second thing was the order to get on the plane. Um, and uh, so I appeared at the, uh, the first hearing I appeared in was in early March. And five days later, I was fired uh, via email. Uh, did it upset me? Yeah, it did. But uh, on the other hand, I did I did defy a direct order. So. Uh, you know, I, I made the decision and I'm prepared to live with it. Um, you know, it's unfortunate. Uh, there's a lot of people that have, uh, that have, you know, felt that I should have reacted stronger. But, you know, this, this to me, um, it was a decision that I made. Um, you know, I, one of my political mentors, uh, the late uh, U.S. Senator Paul Wellstone, uh, had a great quote that he used often that, uh, if we don't fight hard enough for the things that we believe in, at some point we have to realize we don't really stand for them. And I am a big believer in uh, the citizen participation in democracy. Uh, that this this case is bigger than just the uh, the American and the and the one German NGO. There's been uh, uh, estimates that over 400 Egyptian non-governmental organizations, citizen groups, uh, are under this. Uh, sort of uh, assault on civil society. And I, I decided that personally it was a fight that was worth fighting. But isn't that also a principle that NDI says they stand for? They do. Uh, and I, you know, uh, that, that's something that they'll have to rectify in the future. I, uh, you know, I, I, I do have uh, some problems with uh, some of the leadership decisions, but NDI is a, is a great organization. Uh, they work in over 100 countries around the world. I know uh, dozens and dozens of field staff that are right now today uh, working in countries that uh, you know that don't uh, don't hold a high standard for human rights and don't hold a high standard for civil society that are you know sort of putting themselves at risk every day. Uh, you know, I I have a lot of respect for the field staff around the world that are that are working tonight. But if we look at the at the higher um, level of the NDI, I mean, the NDI is an NGO. And looking at this case, one uh, can't feel, can't help but feel that this is more a diplomatic thing, a thing of U.S. foreign policy. Uh, how does the, this go together, that we have a non-governmental uh, organization, yet the, the decisions, the orders that you receive sound more like a governmental decision, don't they? Yeah, I mean, I was, uh, I was on the ground here in Cairo, so what was going on behind the scenes in Washington, I didn't get, uh, you know, didn't get a whole lot of insight into. Uh, I know that the argument that was presented to me was that uh, it was important for all the foreign nationals that were charged in this case uh, to leave because there was a working theory that uh, if all the foreigners left, then the Egyptian government would go easy on the Egyptian staff. To which I countered um, an alternate working theory that if all the foreigners leave, they may uh, retaliate against the Egyptian staff. Uh, so, you know, 
the U.S. foreign policy angle on it, um, you know, this has not been in the forefront now for most of the year. Um, you know, it, it's, you know, for myself personally, uh, if you're going to stand for democracy and stand for human rights, um, I, I, I do wish they'd have taken a stronger stand here. Uh, and that's something that when this case is over with, you know, we'll all have to deal with. Um, you know, in Egypt right now, and my apologies, the call to prayers is bellowing out in the background. Uh, that's in Egypt, Yeah, in, in Egypt right now, um, you know, if democracy is going to survive uh, following the revolution, citizenry, the citizenry have to be a part of it. Uh, people have to not fear organizing at the local level to fight, you know, corruption in Port Said or to, uh, you know, provide uh, literacy programs for adults in Fayoum, whatever sort of non-governmental organizations that may crop up around the country, they need to be able to go without government interference. And that's a position that I think that the West uh, needs to be stronger about. Uh, and it's a position that even internally within Egypt, they have to come to grips with the fact that this, this democracy won't survive without the uh, active participation of uh, the Egyptian people. Let me get back, though, to the country you belong to. Um, even though NDI fired you because you defied those orders, you are, after all, an American citizen still. How does the U.S. and or NDI support you now since that plane left? Uh, they still pay for the legal team that is defending us in court. Um, that, that is, um, that's the only support that I get right now. Um, and, you know, um, I'm a bit uh, out on a limb and alone, but um, I'm, I'm comfortable with it. I, uh, I sleep very well at night. I, I, you know, I, I made a decision to stick with my, with my staff. Um, I mean, my personal opinion is how dare, uh, how dare we as a, an American NGO come to this country and preach democracy and, uh, and uh, preach human rights. And the first time that we get hit with, um, you know, some paperwork felonies, that the instinct is to run. Uh, it's, a, it's a, you know, I haven't spoken a lot publicly about it, but my actions show that I completely disagree with the decision to go. And, uh, you know, when this trial's over with, um, I look forward to getting on with my life. What do you see that um, with regard to the way the Germans are dealing with the Konrad Adenauer Stiftung is also in this? Um, there is one um, German Egyptian woman that is sharing the cage with you on these trial sessions. Um, do the Germans do anything different with regard to supporting her? Um, I I can't speak specifically to to her situation. I can just tell you that I observe uh, at every court hearing there's a very, very large contingent from the German in embassy. Uh, you know, they seem to be pretty engaged. Uh, I mean, the Konrad Adenauer uh, organization has, has been working in Egypt for three decades. So, um, you know, they, they, like the other four organizations, feel that they were very wronged uh, in this raid. And, uh, You know, like I say, uh, those of us, the 15 of us that, uh, that stand in the cage uh, every month, uh, for now what's been going on for a year, uh, I think we all wish our governments uh, were being a bit more vocal. But, um, you know, uh, the trial is it's about evidence. And uh, so far there hasn't been any evidence presented against us. We are all um, sort of cautiously optimistic that uh, sometime soon, inshallah, we will get the words that we want to hear, and that's not guilty. Before we get to the details of how these trial sessions uh, inflict your life and how they are conducted, let's just look at the political side for one moment still. Heba Moria from the Human Rights Watch that I talked to a few days ago called this whole trial session against NGOs a smear campaign basically uh, based on conflicts between U.S. and Egypt, mainly in the person of Faisal Abu Naga. Is this something you can relate to? Well, um, if you ask me who started this and who I would pin blame on, it would be former minister Faisal Abu Naga. Um, her, uh, her testimony uh, this past fall was, um, was, rather, it was rather outstanding. It was... Uh, Two hours, uh, the bulk of it was, um, uh, you know, her sort of open disdain for the United States government. Um, you know, uh, she proved our point that this is, uh, this is uh, simply a political case. Uh, none of her testimony related to anything to do with the charges that have been brought against us. 
Uh, and, you know, all of this could have been avoided if uh, the Egyptian government had a frank conversation with the U.S. government. Um, you know, the 15 of us that are in the cage right now, uh, we're all accused of working for non-governmental organizations. So the implication that, uh, you know, that we're, you know, we have something to do with political fight between Egypt and the United States, uh, the, the biggest sort of mistake that the Egyptian government makes is they, 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 they forget about that word non. Um, you know, uh, my job was to impart the knowledge I had of 23 years working in politics around the world and to teach Egyptians how to run a proper political campaign. Uh, and that's it. And there's been no evidence presented um, otherwise that any of us have done anything but what our jobs were. So um, is it a smear campaign? Yes, it is. Uh, and it's been ongoing. Um, as I mentioned earlier, there's been estimates of uh, an upwards of 400 organizations that have been caught in this net. Uh, it is, um, you know, it's dangerous uh, for the future. Um, you know, you look right now at, the, at all the problems that uh, Egypt is confronting uh, coming out of 30 years of dictatorship. Uh, there is uh, a lot of that citizens of Egypt could be, could be helping this government to organize on whether it be economics or education or, you know, or all the other sort of elements of society. And right now, see a general fear uh, in the non-governmental world, the civil society world, about, um, you know, being too vocal um, for fear that they could, uh, they could end up, uh, you know, in the cage like we were. Uh, so it's, it's a, the, the, the NGO laws here have been confusingly gray for a long time. Um, you know, there are, there is some language in the current, uh, constitution that's been passed, which, uh, could potentially clear it up. But, uh, again, for a uh, democracy to survive, um, the citizens have to be a part of it and they have to not fear organizing themselves and speaking out, uh, whether it be in a negative way or a positive way. Robert, let, let us talk about the cage that, that you are allowed to visit on such a frequent basis. Um, not everywhere around the world it is customary to put people in a cage uh, when you have a trial hearing. This whole case that has been so um, it's such a diplomatic row has a human side to it. People sitting in this cage, people uh, having to endure whatever conditions that go along. Give us an insight on this. What it is like to sit in such a cage? Uh, are you allowed to sit? No, there are no chairs, so we stand. Uh, uh, several of my colleagues bring um, and are allowed to bring in small little fold-up uh, sort of uh, footstools that they can sit on. Uh, my my biggest complaint. I mean, look, I'm you know uh, I'm 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 an American in Egypt, so I um, you know I I come from a different uh, legal system. Um, I don't particularly have a problem with the cage. I know a lot of people in the West are sort of outraged by that. My only complaint in it uh, is the acoustics. It is very, very difficult to hear uh, what is being said. Um, I don't speak uh, Arabic, but even the, the Arabic speakers, it, it's, it's just you flat can't hear. So uh, if there were going to be uh, judicial reforms moving forward, I would say that uh, you know people accused of crimes should have the basic right to be able to hear what the lawyers and the judges are saying and the witnesses. Um, You know, as far as the system, um, you know, look, everything I've observed uh, from the judges so far uh, has been uh, patience, uh, a very strict adherence to the rule of law. Uh, that gives me confidence. Um, the judicial system has been maligned uh, in Egypt uh, here of, of late, uh, but the judges themselves, and look, I got to see them sort of operate first and during the parliamentary elections. They pride themselves in their independence and... Uh, The one sort of blessing we have is that we have uh, a set of judges that seem to be uh, focused on uh, just the facts of the case. And um, uh, that gives us uh, a bit of reassurance moving forward. Let's pick up on the judges again before we get back to the cage. Uh, the judges indeed seem to, to have the interest, as you say, and as one can observe when one follows up this, uh, this, this trial session, to make sure this is not a farce as some would perhaps expect it to be. Has this changed? Has the tone bettered since there was a freely elected president, or has this been throughout the whole sessions? Uh, haven't really noticed uh, any change of tone. Uh, I mean, there has been a lot uh, that has happened during the course of this year in Egypt. Uh, 
you know, you had the uh, the election of uh, the president in June. You had the dissolution of parliament. Uh, you know, you had the uh, the Sinai Ramadan massacre of uh, 16 Egyptian troops. You had uh, all the um, uh, the fall uh, with the decree and the marches on the palace. And uh, you know, other than the last hearing where the judges were on strike, I've seen no change uh, in their uh, demeanor. Uh, which is good. So, I mean, they're they're not letting the sort of the outside events going on in the country affect the case, uh, as far as I can tell. Um, you know, the lawyers and the judges uh, seem to be focused uh, on presenting the facts. Um, the prosecution presented uh, six or seven witnesses. Uh, the defense, for the most part, uh, rested. Uh, there were just a few uh, defense witnesses that were called, uh, and in the prosecution. Gave closing argument, which pretty much mirrored uh, the the topics of the news conference from way back in February, and now the next step will be defense closing arguments and then verdict. So I haven't seen any big change since uh, President Morphy has taken office. Can we recall again how a day in the cage is spent? You were very kind to point out that you are American. There's a different legal system. You, you yep. obviously don't want to criticize too much. This is okay, but on the other hand. When following up on the trials, we can also see that the Egyptian colleagues that are with you in this cage um, are just as uneasy about this form of, uh, of conducting a trial um, while they have to sit in this cage and don't feel, feel very good about this. Um, when you say it's very, very difficult for you to understand what is going on, you once, when Faisal Abu Naga had her testimony, posted a pic and said, this is what I see of her. What one could yeah. basically see on this picture was a lot of mesh and yes. something behind that that could have resembled a camel. Not that I want to say that Faisal Abu Naga presents a camel, but there was basically nothing to be seen. You are the defendant. Give us, a, give us an insight. You are sitting in this cage. You don't hear well. No. You don't see well. Does this no. mean that all this is basically happening somewhere else and all you are are leftovers pushed to the side not having a right to participate in all this? Yeah, I mean, we're required by law to be there. Uh, there's not been uh, very much, um, uh, I mean, there's no active participation in the case. Uh, that, that photograph you saw, uh, yeah, that's our view. It's, uh, it's a mesh cage. Uh, and as I said earlier, you can't hear anything. Uh, during the summer, it was also extremely hot. Uh, there's no ventilation in there. So it, uh, you know, look, I mean, there's a lot of people that uh, would argue that, well, we're charged with felonies, so we don't get, uh, you know, plush seating. Uh, but, Basic uh, human you know, rights wouldn't hurt. Yeah, well, you know, there's a, the, the bulk of the defendants are, are relatively young, but there's a couple of us in the cage that, uh, you know, standing for five or six hours gets a little hard on the back and uh, the hips. But, uh You know, I, I, I don't complain. It's it, like I say, I could have boarded that plane and I could have run to the comforts of the United States. Um, you know, uh, you know, just, uh, you know, the the indignity that we sort of suffer on this. Um, you know, we, we hold sort of great hope that uh, we will hear, hear the words not guilty and we'll walk out of that uh, that cage with our heads high. Um, you know, it. Uh, you know, the first time I went, um, Uh, in March, uh, I got in the line to go into the court with uh, the defendants, was actually told by one of the guards that I was in the wrong line. Uh, and I said, no, I, and I handed him a copy of my court summons, and uh, he was surprised and then was very welcoming, very nice. And uh, so, you know, we, we, when we arrive, we go in, uh, they will call us forward, we will present uh, uh, the bailiff, I guess would be the proper word for it, with our IDs and we get ushered in a cage and then we don't, uh, we don't come out until court's adjourned. Uh, you know, once in the cage, uh, you know, there's a lot of, uh, camaraderie between us. Um, you know, none of us really knew each other before the charges. I mean, outside of our organizational people. So I've developed, uh, some wonderful friendships with the defendants and, uh, hopefully someday we'll all be free and clear and can get back to work. Still let me pick up on this. Do I understand this correctly that no matter how long the session takes and if the court even goes into recess, which sometimes takes one or two hours, you're still stuck in this cage until the whole thing is over for the day? Yes. Uh, if there is a prolonged uh, break, 
um, if there's a, you know, there have been some breaks in the trial. They, you know, they are humane enough that they'll, um, they'll allow us to use a bathroom. So they'll escort the women to the women's facility and the men, uh, down to the men's. But, uh, you know, also during break, there are, uh, as is the case throughout Egypt, there are, uh, vendors everywhere. So, uh, you know, uh, there was one hearing where we were able to order, uh, you know, 15 teas and they were brought on a, uh, you know, little platter and served to us. Um, so we're, you know, we're able to, you know, during the breaks, we're able to use the bathroom and gain nourishment. But other than that, we're we're in the cage. Fifteen teas served in a cage. If, if this goes out into the world, <laughs> interesting. Well, uh, it, it was <laughs> what a clash uh, yeah. life to have. <laughs> Let me still ask one question with regard to whether you interact with your lawyers or not. If you are in this cage now for so many hours and you basically have no possibility to participate in what is going on. You have your lawyers on the one side of the mesh cage doing their bit and you're inside basically as much um, spectators as we are but for the fact that you are encaged. Is this correct or have you any chance of interacting with your lawyer during a trial session? Not while it's going on, no. Um, I mean, during the breaks, uh, the lawyers will come over to the cage. Uh, they will update us on anything we need an update on. Uh, but no, while testimony is going on, it's, uh, it's unlike... Uh, what you might see in a Western court system, you know, the defendants don't get to whisper in their lawyer's ear. So there's, there's no contact. Uh, but during a break, uh, the lawyers will come over and give us a sense of how they think things are going. But it's not possible that, as we know it from other legal systems, a lawyer within this court session comes over to you and says, give me a briefing on this. I'm being asked by the judge or the prosecutor on this behalf. I can't answer this properly. What is our line of defense? This doesn't want work. You have to uh, fix everything prior to the date. Yeah, it doesn't work, and, and, and there's never been a, uh, as far as I know, there's never been a sense where the lawyer would want to come over and ask that during trial, so I don't know if it's, quite frankly, I don't know if it's allowed. Uh, it's just never happened. Um, you know, the, the judge will start the proceedings, the lawyers will start their arguing, and, you know, we just stay in the cage and try to strain and hear what's going on. Do you speak Arabic? Do you understand what's going on? I do not. I have, but I have uh, 14 colleagues who do, and they will routinely give me an update. Uh, not, not a word for word, but they'll let me know what's going on. It seems generally you are allowed to, to take your cell phones into that cage, but when Pfizer was uh, on stand uh, for security reasons, I take it, I don't know, perhaps you wanted to shoot over that, uh, they were confiscated. But generally you have your cell phones so you can connect to the outside world? We are, uh, we're not allowed to have the cell phones in the cage. So uh, How do you tweet? Uh, you do. Uh, well, um, I, I don't know that I've ever actually tweeted while I've been in the cage. I might have been very mistaken on this. Forgive me. You, you could be. Uh, yeah, no, it's, uh, uh, it's my understanding that uh, you're not supposed to use a cell phone. Um, you know, there has been... Then you definitely haven't. Yeah, there's been uh, very few instances where the guards have uh, made an issue with it. Uh, they don't collect them. Um, so, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, you know, we don't make phone calls in there, but, um, yeah, I will admit to occasionally checking Twitter. There are quite a few uh, activists that are kind enough to come to the hearings and live tweet what's going on, which, uh, given the lack of acoustics in the cage, is uh, very helpful uh, because, uh, you know, especially uh, during uh, Faisal Abunaga's testimony and that of the other government witnesses, we couldn't hear a word. So. We were able to follow along on the hashtag NGO trial and get sort of a blow-by-blow blow of what was being said against us, which is, uh, it, I mean, it's comforting. When you cannot hear what's going on, it uh, you know, gets a little uh, disconcerting. So uh, there, is a, there is a technological element, although uh, it's my understanding we're not allowed to have our cell phones in the cage, so therefore we don't. Besides the absurdity that you being in this hashtag uh, have to follow the hashtag to know what's going on, um, but it does help you psychologically, though, to know that people are outside tweeting live, both from within the courtroom as well as retweeting this to the world. Yes. Uh, you know, when this uh, first started uh, a year ago this time, all through January and February, it was a major sort of international focus. And uh, once, the, uh, uh, once all the foreign defendants uh, left Egypt, uh, the, the press coverage died down a bit. Um, I was initially, I initially wasn't doing a lot of interviews. I uh, was maintaining sort of a low profile because I knew that uh, my appearance in court was going to be a bit of a surprise. 
Uh, there was still, uh, you know, a lot of, uh, you know, sort of an open discussion going on in Egypt with what just happened. Why did the government let the foreigners leave? So I was very quiet, uh, you know, mainly uh, for my own sort of personal security uh, and also until I got a better sense of where I stood on legal ground. Uh, and then uh, I think it was around April uh, we were in the cage and uh, several of my colleagues were lamenting the fact that there was no longer any sort of press coverage on this. And uh, I was basically drafted to start, uh, to start doing interviews to keep, keep the shining the light on it. Um, you know, this has uh, not only strained the relationships uh, between several countries in Egypt, but it's also uh, greatly impacted the lives of um, you know, uh, of especially the the Egyptian defendants, and uh, you know, uh, when I give uh, interviews, I make sure that it's not it's not me, the lone American. This is, uh, you know, there are thirteen Egyptians uh, in that cage who, uh, you know, took these jobs to help improve their country. They they to me, uh, they're great patriots. Uh, they're good organizers. Uh, you know, their their only crime is is working very hard to you know, see a better Egypt. So uh, I'll keep giving the interviews uh, and, uh, you know, keep sort of uh, pushing the story because it is, it's an important one. And it, it, it does have a ripple effect. It has a ripple effect in Egypt uh, with the sort of the ongoing crackdown on other non-governmental organizations. And uh, it's had a ripple effect in the region. Uh, I mean, the UAE, uh, uh, United Arab Emirates last year, cracked down on several uh, uh, non-governmental organizations. So, uh, it's a fight worth fighting. Uh, whether you're in Egypt or any other democracy around the world, uh, the participation of, of the people is a must. Uh, so, uh, you know, I'll, I'll keep giving interviews and uh, keep declaring our, our, our innocence and uh, keep fighting the fight. It's a very important point you make that um, that's the whole process has a, has a huge implication, not only for you, but for the Egyptians that are with you in that cage. Let's jump out of that cage for a second and go into the normal daily life. What does this whole process have, uh, what are the consequences for the Egyptian colleagues? You weren't the only one who was fired, I take it? Um, actually, other? I was. I was. The, 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 four, um, the four Egyptian colleagues uh, from, from NDI are, are still, uh, as far as I know, are still being paid. Uh, there's no work to be done, but they're still drawing a, a paycheck. Uh, the bigger impact is on the rest of our staff. Uh, NDI had a staff of 75 or 80 uh, Egyptians around the country. We had three offices, and uh, you know, uh, most of those folks have have lost their jobs. And um, you know, with the state-run media campaign against them and and all the press coverage from a year ago. Uh, it, it's hurt their careers. I, I spoke uh, several months ago with a, with a young Egyptian woman who uh, worked in our bookkeeping department who had gone to apply for a job at a, at a regular bank. And, uh, you know, when, when they saw on her, her resume that she had worked with NDI, they, they did not hire her. So uh, the impact on uh, the Egyptians, I mean, it's 75 people that were out of work just from our organization. I don't know the, the numbers from the others, but in an economy that is struggling, uh, you know, we played a small role in in putting people back to work. Um, you know, and and part of that was, you know, we, we, I mean, we were paying our employees through the Egyptian uh, Social Security and tax system, so that's a loss of revenue. And again, it's small, but when you multiply that across the board uh, with groups that have had to lay off workers, uh, plus the general fear of uh, foreign investment now. Uh, it goes beyond just economic projects. Um, I had a conversation a while back with somebody who worked for UNESCO who said there were tens of millions of euros uh, for the restoration of historical uh, sites uh, around Egypt that uh, are also a key um, sort of, um, you know, for fueling tourism. She, she told me that because of this NGO trial, there were tens of millions of euros that were on hold. The investors were afraid to invest. Uh, on the Egyptian end, the non-governmental organizations that would do the work were afraid to receive it. Uh, so it's, um, it, 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 you know, there's a lot of uh, things that, that are causing economic uh, uh, crisis here. This is a small part of it. Um, so, you know, it's, it's something that's going to have to be fixed. But does that mean for the individuals that are in the cage with you and have to spend the normal day outside this cage, facing all the complications that come with it, 
their bio is blemished. That means even if you get acquitted, this is it, and they will hardly have a, have a chance to, to find work again? In some sectors, yes. I mean, there was a very large um, uh, sort of state-run uh, media campaign that backed up uh, this whole crackdown um, where, I, you know, you had uh, media personalities like uh, uh, this, uh, I'm forgetting his first name, but Akasha, uh, uh, sort of a, he's a Falul talk show host uh, who was on air calling for our execution. Um, you know, uh, questioning the patriotism of the Egyptians that work for these uh, NGOs. Uh, you had members of parliament that were doing the same thing. So, uh, you know, time and distance, um, I think, will help. But, uh, yeah, there's a bit of a stigma. Now, on the flip side of that, uh, you know, media-wise, I sensed a general uh, shift after the, the foreigners left, after all the run-up about the harm that these NGOs had done to the revolution and to Egypt and to the Mubarak regime, um, you know, when the Egyptian government then let the the foreigners board the airplane and leave, there were quite a few uh, Egyptians that were then saying, well, wait a minute, if they were guilty of all these high crimes of treason, why did we just let them go? So there was a general sort of shift uh, in public opinion uh, so that now um, I think most, most Egyptians um, are convinced that the trial is a farce. Uh, I don't get uh, I don't get as much uh, pushback on social media from people that are you know uh, you know I mean I had uh, more than a fair share of death threats through uh, uh, January February, so uh, you know it's died down a bit and I think some people have gone back to normal life. But uh, while the trial hangs over for all of us, yeah, it, it definitely hurts. Um, so, again, the most important words we look forward to hearing uh, sometime in early 2013 are not guilty. Uh, and then uh, hopefully we can all move on with our lives. While we're at it, how many friends did you lose over this? Friends have I lost? I haven't lost any friends. Uh, I've probably had a few acquaintances that have dropped off my radar. But uh, on a personal note, uh, my friends uh, have, have rallied to my cause. Uh, I, uh, like I say, I... Um, you know, through 23 years in politics, I was not known as a, as a big sort of media talker. I was more of a behind-the-scenes guy. Uh, when I run uh, a campaign, whether they're running for Congress or for Parliament uh, in a Southeast Asia country, it's not about me. It's always been about, uh, you know, the man or woman who's running for office. So I've always been behind the scenes. So, uh, you know, once my name was tweeted... Um, uh, here in the Egyptian sphere, that all sort of changed. My anonymity was a bit blown, so I'm I'm more of a public speaker now uh, on current affairs. But uh, you know, like I say, I I look forward to getting this behind me, and uh, you know, I'm uh, I'm very blessed to have friends around the world that have rallied to my cause, and uh, you know, hopefully, um, uh, when we hear the words "not guilty," if, if for some reason I, we hear the other way around, uh, I'm hoping that some of my friends will rally to my defense and, you know, get me out of an Egyptian prison should it come to that. Well, we all hope it doesn't come to that. Robert, may I still get back to the Egyptians one more time? I mean, as you point out, you have this history of 23 years of political work around the world, so um, your self-esteem is based on what you've done in all this time. Uh, you are different, of course, to those many in, those cage, in that cage that are younger, as you pointed out. Yep. When when we follow up on the tweets of those that are with you in that cage, we can easily read days behind before the next session. They can hardly sleep. They are depressed. They're full of anxieties. They loathe what is going to come to them. They loathe that is this is practically, as they say, destroying their whole life. Um, how how do you see this now with regard to your colleagues and the friends you made in that cage that are younger? What will this do for their self-esteem and their hope for the future? Well, you know, I can speak. Uh, I can speak to the the four uh, of my colleagues, uh, and yes, they do loathe the experience. Uh, but um, I, I, you know, I'm hopeful that when we get out of this, that they will remain uh, engaged uh, in improving the country. Um, you know, it's. Uh, you know, yeah, there is a big difference because I am older and a, a bit more experienced uh, in, in in politics. But Egypt. Uh, the future of Egypt is uh, is the youth, and uh, you know they need uh, you know Mohammed and Hafsa and Rauda, my you know the colleagues I'm closest to. 
uh, Egypt needs them engaged in the political and civil society process moving forward. They need hundreds of, of folks like that. So I, I am hopeful that a not guilty verdict uh, and some clearer, better defined NGO laws uh, will will get back to sort of where we were a year and a half ago uh, when there was a general new sense of freedom on the streets of Egypt uh, because uh, this, you know, Fixing the problems of, of 30 years of dictatorship is going to take a long, long time, and Egypt needs the valuable contribution of these uh, Egyptians that are in the cage. Uh, like I say, I consider them patriots. Um, you know, their only crime is 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 working really, really hard to try to improve their country. And uh, part of my role, I mean, I, I communicate with them regularly. They're they're friends. Uh, they're part of my family. Uh, you know, I would encourage them, uh, you know, to keep up the fight. Um, you know, so that's where my hope is. Um, you know, again, it's uh, half this country is under the age of forty, and uh, you know, if if Egypt is going to succeed and and sort of get to where they want to be in the future as a you know functioning democratic country, they need these people. Uh, so I I consider part of my role is to keep try to keep their spirits high and try to keep them engaged in the process, and hopefully uh, we'll be able to support them in the future. Okay, thanks. I think we can't finish this interview without posing one question which comes to everyone's mind. When you were working still, when you were still allowed to work, you were also advising the Muslim Brotherhood, you were advising the Salafi parties. Now we have a president in Egypt who belongs to the Muslim Brotherhood. One would think that perhaps from the work you did before advising them, that showed them that what you actually did was not what you're implicated for. You might have a bridge to, to walk over to... Um, okay. There's, there's, we all know what has happened since the election of a free president. Of course, I'm not belittling that, but there's, there's no change you see that could give you hope there, is there? With regard well, to I, understanding what this trial is actually about. Well, it, uh, I mean, uh, our, our mandate, and this was an organizational mandate, that uh, you know, we, would, uh, we would train any uh, uh, licensed political party uh, as long as they did not advocate violence and they supported multi-party democracy. So um, you know, our training team, and it wasn't limited to just me, there were probably seven or eight of us uh, that were uh, international trainers that came in, uh, we did teach all parties. Um, you know, moving forward... Um, you know, it, it uh, the Muslim Brotherhood and the, and the Morsi administration uh, has been widely criticized uh, at the way they handled the, the constitutional decree. Uh, and, you know, it's sort of, they, they have closed themselves. They have cut off, uh, you know, work. I mean, you take an example uh, with, with the decree that was so controversial. One of them was uh, the complaints about the judiciary and the public prosecutor. That would have been a perfect way for the Morsi administration to reach out to, uh, you know, organizations, groups, and parties outside of their fold uh, in the human rights world, in the judicial reform world, uh, within liberal parties, to build sort of a national consensus for the need for change, uh, to bring people inside the tent to build uh, a better Egypt. Instead, they did the decree um, and, you know, uh, sort of fast track this whole process and made it clear that they did not want uh, the help of outside parties. So when looking at the future, the lesson that Egyptians uh, in power need to learn and those who aspire for power is that, you know, in a democracy, there's, wi there's winning and there's losing, right? When you win the parliament, you control the spoils of winning. But when you're writing a constitution or when you are trying to address sort of the nation as a whole, you have to reach out and work across party lines, across ideological lines. Uh, otherwise, you, you, you get into a bunker mentality, uh, whereas when you look at now, um, I mean, you know, you've got an economy that is on the brink. Um, you have a lot of uh, people in this country that could be helpful in solving that problem that do not have a seat at the table. Uh, the new appointments to the Shura have been overwhelmingly Islamist. Uh, you have a lot of people in positions that are making critical decisions that it's questionable whether they have uh, the wherewithal to make them. But more importantly, you don't, there's not an open dialogue going on with the Egyptian people. 
Case in point, when Morsi did the decree about a month or so ago announcing the increase in taxes, the increase in the cost of um, you know, the things that affect everyday life in Egypt uh, for the working poor, for the unemployed, uh, you know, the cost of cooking oil, the cost of uh, electricity, water, there was no dialogue. It was done by decree. And about 14 hours after he did it, because the social media erupted mainly within the Muslim Brotherhood and Salafi forces about how unfair it was, so those tax increases and price increases uh, are going to come back, and there has been no open dialogue. There has been no public hearings on it. There's been no outreach uh, to the farmers in Upper Egypt or the factory workers uh, in the Delta to sort of explain what the rationale is behind these changes, uh, the changes in subsidies, changes in taxes. So, you know, moving forward in Egypt, uh, you know, civil society can play a huge role in that. Uh, and in terms of bridging the gap between the government uh, and, and, and the people on the streets. And so, um, you know, there's going to have to be some, some new thinking moving forward, uh, not only within this government, but also within uh, the opposition parties. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, you know, it, it just government doesn't work if people aren't talking to each other. With all the problems that you pointed out, especially with the economy, which given loans that some discuss now also have an international impact. The NGO trial is in the way of many things that uh, are discussed on an international basis to move forward. Uh, you sometimes say whether we are um, acquitted or have to go to jail. Do you seriously think there could be a jail term in this for all of you? I've seen stranger things happen in this country. Uh, I mean, I've I've come to love living in Cairo, come to love living in Egypt. I I, I don't I, you know I don't take anything for granted. Um, I, I you know I maintain confidence that if evidence matters in a court proceeding uh, in Egypt, then we will be found not guilty, uh, or at the very least, the charges dropped. But uh, stranger things have happened. So uh, you know, I uh, certainly don't want to spend the next four to six years in an Egyptian prison, but uh, it's a distinct possibility. Uh, but, you know, I, I think with everything that is going on, uh, this is, you know, sort of, it, it is a very political case. And the last thing that Egypt needs right now uh, would be a guilty verdict on it, uh, mainly because there's no evidence behind it. But, you know, while the international media may have stopped covering the case a bit, I bet they'd start covering it again if it came down with a guilty verdict. So, um, you know, again, Moving forward, uh, you know, the, the Muslim Brotherhood needs to get out of its bunker mentality. Uh, they need to start reaching out to the, the NGO world, the civil society world, political parties, because there are very, very large problems that need solutions. And uh, the thing that I think is missing the most right now uh, in, in Egyptian politics from all sides is, uh, is the word karama, dignity. Um, you know, a lot of these decrees uh, and economic things that are coming out, there, there's not a lot of thought process about what, you know, what is the, what does this do to the dignity of the Egyptian uh, man or woman, uh, no matter where they live in the country. And, uh, you know, it just, it, 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 it's astounding to me that uh, we could be going on a course where they will raise the prices of basically everything. Uh, without any sort of real reform uh, or improvement of wages or economic growth to offset that. Um, there, the, the Ministry of Planning, and I, I'm, I'm forgetting his name, was actually quoted two or three days ago saying that the typical Egyptian can survive uh, on eight pounds per day. Uh, I mean, the United Nations poverty line of two U.S. dollars a day here equates to what's now uh, 11 pounds. Uh, I mean, I just, you know... There, there has to be uh, a better sense of cooperation moving forward, um, and it has to be, uh, you know, all sides sort of working together. Um, you know, I, I just, you know, everything that gets lost is right now, tonight, as the sun has gone down, there are tens of millions of Egyptian families that, are, that have struggled through today that may not be able to afford to eat, that may not know where, uh, um, you know, a wage to pay for tomorrow's meal is going to come from. That uh, you know that may be losing um, you know hope for the future of their children, and that's something that uh, that government and civil society needs to address and needs to turn around, um, because uh, that's the most important thing. You've got 40, 45 million people right now that are that are living in dire poverty, 
in this nation. And uh, the biggest sort of assault I've seen, and again, I see this from, uh, from all political factions, is an assault on their dignity. Dignity is a huge issue in this, both we feel for the people that are in the cage and the people that are out of the cage. Robert, on January 10th, the next session is on. The world is looking to Cairo and watching, waiting and hoping and holding thumbs. Um, you are aware that they are. People are just a tweet away, so mesh can't be such a thick fabric, I suppose. We wish you all the best. Much luck. Thanks a lot for your time and for this interview. All right. Thank you very much, Jonathan. Appreciate it. See you.